The first handout that we have is the one that you got at the door, which we just found through the, D the National DBSA, which looks like this one. The helping a friend of family member with depression and bipolar disorder. Everybody have one of these, I hope? Looks like this. My version does not, but yours does. I have the paper version. So we're going to do that, and I've taken some things and kind of merged some, some notes that I have along with that. So if you're looking at the handout and you're saying, where the hell is he? What the hell is he talking about? That means you don't have the wrong edition. That means that I've added some things. Just want to clue you in on that. All righty. So let's, let's do the handout. Now, one of the things, helping a family, a friend or family member with, de with depression or bipolar disorder, it's like it's such a comprehensive brochure because it covers all the questions that anybody's going to have. Now, I also want to open up the conversation, thinking about this, that we may have some people here that have the mood disorder, and I'm going to ask all of you to think about, kind of outside the box, how that mood disorder affected your family. So for the family members here, that's pretty straightforward. So for the other people, want to kind of open it this way so you can see and kind of start thinking about how did my mood disorder affect them? That's just the side. Okay, so if you, look at, if you look at the beginning of this, which starts at um, first page, starts with mood disorders, right? Mood disorders, bipolar, also known as manic depression, blah, 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 blah. You guys can read. I'm assuming this. Well, let me highlight this. If someone you love has a mood disorder, you may be feeling helpless, overwhelmed, confused, hopeless. You may feel hurt, angry, frustrated, and resentful. You may also have feelings of guilt, shame, or isolation, or feelings of sadness, exhaustion, and fear. Here's the most important sentence in the whole brochure. All these feelings are normal. Most people think that when they have all these feelings, there's something wrong with them. There is not. It's about being connected to a person that has a mood disorder, which is bipolar, it's the Dow Jones version of it. And on the depression side, it's the underside. And when we see people that we love, we have these reactions, we have these normal feelings. That's important to note. Okay, now, there are some stage directions here, which says for more information on mood disorders, use the appendix on page 12. That's where we're going because we've got to get everybody on the right page. Okay, so on your appendix, the one in the book, not the one on your side. Good people pay attention. We have the symptoms of depressions and symptoms of mania. And we have the different terms that go along with us. Let's just kind of look at that for a second. Some of you may know this real well. Some of you may not know this at all. So we're going to get it. Yes. I have a client of mine who has what's called rapid cycling. So at one moment, she can be perfectly fine, and the next moment, she can be in the hospital. So and that, that's happened. So it's so, like, right, that's like that. So symptoms of depression, sad, no interest, no pleasure, changes in eating and sleeping, sometimes sleeping too much, sometimes sleeping too little, sometimes eating too much, sometimes eating too little, feeling like crap, no energy, no desire. There's a black filter over the entire universe. Everything is dark. Nothing's good, et cetera, et cetera. Cognitively, no, no, no memory, no concentration, bad. On the manic side of things, it's the opposite. Lots of energy, lots and lots and lots of, lots of talk, lots of speech, lots of lots and lots of, you know, no sleep required. I'm having all kinds of great ideas about what I'm going to do and how I'm going to put together my great new business, and I don't need sleep, and this is great, and I'm not eating, and the world is great, and it's that, it's that. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. Now, just to confuse people a little bit, there are some people who have bipolar disorder, and what they have, if this is the Mason-Dixon line of mood, they have a little mania, and they have the bargain basement depression. So they have a little bit, and then they have that. So if you look at our symptoms, go to the next page, you'll see that when we start to describe these guys, right, we'll describe them as as cyclomania, that mood thing, the rapid cycling we talked about, the mixed state, which is what you talked about. Right, what's your name, I'm sorry? David. David, that's what you talked about. We have the person that has the hypomanic episode, that is if they're manic at a period of time. 
So the different ways. So lots of times you have those people that are ludomania, lots of depression. They don't do a lot. They stay under the covers a lot. But they have bipolar because they're a little bit above the line. Yep. Different versions of the same animal, yes. Okay, so if you keep going, what's the difference between a mood disorder and an ordinary mood swing? Right? Because if you think about it, most of us get moody. A lot of us don't swing, though, so let's start there. Right? Well, at least not, I mean, we might do it dance wise, but not usually. Um, right? So the key factors, like everything else, intensity, length, and interference with life. A person that has a mood disorder, their disorder interferes with their daily life. That's the key. We can look at intensity, it's pretty bad, we can look at the length, but the key factor is how it interferes. If you lived in a log cabin, you could have a mood disorder all your life and live in the woods someplace and nobody would know, and nobody would care. If you live in society, it's going to interfere with your life, and that's, and that's the key factor. All right, so let's go, let's go forward. Remember, your loved one's illness is not your fault. Underline. You can't, make the, you can't make the person you care about well. That's their job. Everybody that has a mood disorder has different symptoms that go with it. It's what I call trigger symptoms. There is a guy that I see who he knows he's headed for depression when he stops sleeping. That's his trigger. Everybody has a different one. It's unique to the person. As family members, you pay attention. But you pay attention from the last row at MetLife Stadium, not on the first row at MetLife Stadium, because you can't do much about it anyway. You, but you can say, hey, you know, I've noticed you're not sleeping. What's up? So you pay attention. And the best way to find out about all this is, is, is what you're doing here tonight, getting educated and learning more. Most important thing. Okay. Some things that's not in your handout. Depression is a serious condition. Don't underestimate how serious it is. It drains the person's energy, their optimism, their motivation. Again, they see the world through that dark filter. Everything's bad. There's nothing good. You could say anything in the world that you want. If they're still seeing a dark filter, it's a dark filter. You can't ask them to snap out of it because there's no snapping to be done. Hiding the person's problem won't make it go away. You could say, you know, why don't you stay home today or for the next six weeks or so and maybe it'll get better. Well, maybe it'll get better or maybe you should do something about it. You can't work around, you can't enable the person because that's never going to work. You have to address it head on. And you can't fix it. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, so in your handout, what can I do to help? That's a great question. Okay, let's do the most important word. Illness, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual illness, not weakness, not stupidity, not viral, illness, most important word. So what you can do, you're here, educate yourself, you're here at the group. Give support, give unconditional love and support, not conditional, you know, if you're better today, I'll love you more. No. Not I'll make you your favorite cookies if you're not so depressed. No! Unconditional. The person has an illness. If they had cancer, if they had diabetes, you wouldn't say, oh, well, I know you're going for chemo, but, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of leave you today. Unconditional love and support. Don't try to fix the problem by yourself. It's not fixable by yourself. We need lots of people. What's the expression? You need a village to raise a child? You need a village to, raise, to, to fix bipolar disorder and depression. Remember that the person's attitudes and belief, sometimes it's their disease talking. Sometimes they'll say kind of strange and weird stuff. They're like, what? And their perceptions are going to be a little off. That it's not going to make any sense. That's the disease talking. The guy that I referenced earlier, one of the things that he, he'll talk about, you know, I'm really not doing that good, and I, you know, my, I'm really a failure, and, you know... Probably people would just be, you know, better if I just, you know, quit my job. It's like, that's, that's his illness talking. 
but the fact of the matter is he's awesome at his job, his family loves him, and he's really good at what he is, and he's a good person. So sometimes when he's in that mode, it's his illness talking. We good so far? Good. Okay, next question in, in the pamphlet. What can I do to make sure my loved one gets good treatment? That's a great question. Encourage the person to get help. Encourage is the right word. Don't beg, borrow, scold, plead. Don't. Encourage. Love the person. Find out what's the best treatment that the person can get. Get the person in the hands of a skilled treatment provider. Get a good evaluation. Get a good assessment. Find out what, it, what the animal it is that you're working with. And be open to that. The other thing that I think is also useful from a family perspective that you can encourage your person to do is allow them and encourage them to track their moods. Because once they also know, okay, you know, the second week of the month, I tend, I tend to get pretty funky. I'm not sure why that is now, but I know it's the second week, and now we've got to pay attention to that. And there's lots of places online that you can get mood trackers. There's one on my website. But you can do that and, have the, and encourage the person to track their moods. Anybody with any questions so far? What? What is a mood tracker? Oh, it's a, it's a simple, it's like a graph. It's like a calendar. And it looks, oh, do we have one? I think so. Ah, this is great. What could be better? Seek and you shall find. This is great. A client of mine designed, designed my very first one for me. And basically, it's an Excel spreadsheet that's kind of plus one, plus two, plus three, zero, minus one, minus two, minus three. And because he was a little manic himself, which was very helpful to me at the time, not so much for him, he put in the different stressors that happened and what date and put the whole calendar up there. He did a marvelous job. But it's basically really collecting data. That's the best thing. Okay, how can I help someone that has symptoms of depression or bipolar? Communicate. Communicate unconditional love and support and communicate in a loving way. Some of the examples in the handout. I care. I may not understand your pain, but I can offer my support. You're a worthwhile person and you mean a lot to me. Your brain is lying to you right now and that's part of the illness. Communicate unconditionally. You can generate support. You can, you can encourage the person to seek treatment. You can encourage them to come here to the DBSA. You can encourage the person to do lots of things. And most importantly, if they're taking medication, to take their medication. And you can communicate that in a loving, caring way, starting with the most important letter of the alphabet in order to do that. Does anybody know? One letter first. One letter. I. I love you, I care about you, I'm frustrated, I'm concerned, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm scared. As opposed to the worst word in the English language in terms of communication guaranteed, money back, I'm not completely satisfied to start a fight in every household in America. We know the word? Yep. You, thank you. And because everybody's an attorney in terms of conflict, you know the second worst word to put after you? The absolute language words of always and never. You always do this, you never do this. Guaranteed because the person's a lawyer and to say, no, two weeks ago I didn't do that. And once, two years ago I didn't do that, so it's not always and we have conflict about always and never. I, not you. Now, there are some other worst things to say. I will run them down because I think they're great. Well, they're not great. So this is kind of like the David Letterman top ten list. So number ten. Are you eating right? Has a lot to do with person as a mood disorder. Number nine, life isn't meant to be easy. Number eight, do something nice for yourself. You'll feel better. Number seven, I've had bad days too. You'll feel better tomorrow. Number six, you just need to snap out of it. Number five, cheer up. Just think happy thoughts. Number four, Quit feeling sorry for yourself. It's not that bad. 
Number three, yeah, I know how you feel. Did I ever tell you about the time when I? Number two, it's probably all those medications you're taking. And number one, you are so self-absorbed, you just have to think about others. These are the ten worst things. Things does not... ...say to the person. The best things are the eyes. One more thing from... On bottom of page four, what if my loved one is considering suicide? So let's just cover that because it's in the pamphlet. At least I can say I said it. Okay. If the person is suicidal or homicidal, that's a 911. That's not a conversation. That's not a, gee, I'm not sure that they're that serious. Maybe they're calling out for attention. Maybe this is just something that they're thinking about. Maybe it's not that bad. Maybe, 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 maybe. No, that's a 911. Let the professionals make that determination. Because again, we don't want to believe this as family members. We don't want to believe this at all, you know, because our denial about this is pretty good. But if the person is is giving off some some ideas and some ideas that's okay, maybe they're thinking about this is it, get them in the hands of the professionals. Call 911, get them to the psych emergency services. Don't think about it, don't try to assess it. If you work on the assumption that this is a disease, that the person has. And you work on the assumption that like all other diseases, the person has to take care of it themselves. Right? That puts family members in an interesting place in that they either have to be hyper vigilant to make sure the person is doing everything they're supposed to do, which of course will get them crazy by doing that, or they have to be over here and say, oh, he'll be okay. I think we'll go out of the country for two months. We'll probably be okay when we come back. No. Right? But the key ingredient is to figure out how to take care of yourself. That's the hard part here. Because what happens when you have a person who has any sickness, the people around them are the people who try to get that person well. It doesn't matter what the sickness is. It doesn't matter what the illness is. With this illness, with depression and bipolar, because it changes or it's just so frustrating and so sad and so scary, it's like, well, how can I take care of myself when I'm trying to take care of this person? So, what we have to do is take a page from the good folks at Al-Anon and use some of their language. And in Al-Anon, they talk, they use the C, which are, didn't cause it, can't cure it, can't control it. That applies real well here as well didn't cause it. It's a disease. If someone could tell me what they did that caused the disease, I'd love to hear it. No takers, huh? Good. Um, can't cure it. Not unless someone here has, high, has a great deal of skill in working with professionally people that have mood disorders. And certainly can't control something that you can't figure out what's going to happen from day to day or week to week or month to month. So we use the C's from al We also rely on our al people who talk to us about detach with love, which detachment is about taking two steps back so you can see the field a little better and detach with love. Not detach with anger, not detach with hate, not detach with resentment, not detach with burning the person's house down. Detach with love because the person is sick and they have a disease. If you take those two ingredients together, sprinkle them over here with the mood disorder, we're in good shape. Because we've got a base we can work with. So, one of the first things to remember in terms of taking care of self is to speak up for yourself. Back to that I. Talk honestly to the person about how you're feeling, how I'm feeling. Honest communication. Also, second thing, set boundaries for yourself. Identify what you are going to do and what you're not going to do. Draw your line in the sand. Stay with it. Draw the line in the sand that you can enforce. 
don't say, okay, if you don't if you don't go to the to, if you don't go to the IOP program or the day program, you know we're going to kick you out of the house because this kids can't be, and then don't don't do it. That's worthless. You know we're going to get divorced if you don't get help. Well, if you're not getting divorced, don't say it. Don't put the bottom line in that you can't enforce. Put in the one that you can. Set the boundaries. Understand what's acceptable for self, and work with that. Keep doing things that are good for you. Connect with other friends. Connect with people who understand. Connect with people. Keep doing the things. Go to work if you have a job. Do the things that make sense. Go to the gym. Eat healthy. Do good, healthy activities. And just like being here tonight, getting support. One of the key ingredients in treating any illness is having people who get it. Because the problem with mood disorders is that if you talk to others who don't get it, you get some very strange responses, kind of like our top ten list. You know, well, he's going to be better soon, right? Yeah, okay, maybe. You know, you know, I saw an article in the, in, in the USA Today that, you know, medications don't seem to work as well. Well, thank you for your, for your input. Or, you know... Well, by the way, did you see the new study that they're doing? They're doing a study with ketamine, and, you know, that's really good, and, you know, it's going to cure chronic depression. That's true, by the way. Um, except that it may take out your liver, your insides, and take out your brain, too, because they're not so sure how they're going to work there yet. But, it's, but at least the person won't be depressed. <laughs> so it's gonna, it sounds like it's right on, you know, right on track. Um, because everybody's going to be helpful in their loving and caring way. But if you talk to the wrong people, they're just going to be, what are you talking about? So talking to the right people, like we have here tonight, that's the key. Questions, comments? Oh, again? <laughs> See, this is how you take care of yourself, Mark. You get a good workout. <laughs> I think one of the things um, support people can do is, for example, Maybe, let's say, suggest a peer support group meeting or a lecture. Yep. Offer to go with them. Absolutely. Because that really helps, in any case, even without this, if somebody's going, you're more apt to go than mm -hmm. you go by yourself. Yep. You know, that kind of thing, even though you can't cure it, mm -hmm. you can do you those can kinds of things. You can be a cheerleader. Yeah, right. Okay. Now, thank you for reminding me. Now, do we have any sports fans in the, in the group? Good, perfect. Avid sports fans. Now, here's the thing. Now, as, a, as an average, avid sports fan, we love to root for our favorite team. Some of us, more than others, we think we have magical powers. So we're talking about the people that don't have mood disorders think we have magical powers. When they have mood disorders, they may have that, that may need some medication adjustment. Let's go with me on this. You know, so if I'm wearing my Yankee clothes, and they're playing the Red Sox, I have to sit in my favorite seat, you know, eating my favorite food and, and doing some useful things that I do, which I can't say them because then I'll ruin the, the magic that happens, right, to allow them to win. Now, okay, I'm not psychotic, thank you, as in work, but I believe that it does. So I'm going to cheer my favorite team, I'm going to feel, cheer my Yankees on to win by wearing my special clothes and my special chair and so forth and so on. That's the place you need to be in with your loved one. You recognize you can't change the outcome. You're just going to cheer like crazy for them to get better. And that's really, the, that's really the metaphor that I think works here. You know, in Silver Linings Playbook, which I happen to love, right, we have a little bit of mental illness all along the spectrum. And we have the person who's been hospitalized, which, okay, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. And then we have De Niro, you know, wearing his Philadelphia Eagles clothes and having the things that go the certain way and, and his friend Shirley and the remote control has to be a certain way. And, my, and he's a good example of that. Except he's a little bit, he's got something too, right? But metaphorically, it's about cheering for the other person. It's cheering for your team to try to win the game. I think that's the, that's the metaphor that always makes sense to me. Thank you for that. All right, so let's, let's move to the next thing. So the key ingredient is people have to be able to take care of themselves. In the midst of the storm and the sea of having a person with a mood disorder, 
which could be any day could be different than it was the day before, or could be the same as it was the day before, and it's just nothing but. And of course, this great weather is perfect mood disorder weather. Oh, that's right, the sun was out today, I'm sorry. Twice. For about five minutes. Was the sun out yesterday? I think we're getting sun rationing. I think that's kind of how it works. We don't get too much. So basically, you've had a winter of cold snow, 15 snowstorms, in case you're wondering, and not a lot of days of sunshine. So clearly, not the best weather for people with mood disorders. It's dark outside, dark inside. Not really, not real good. So, so the person could be in a long, protracted depression. They've had that since November. Or they could be, you know, being bipolar and on certain days feeling better and on certain days feeling worse. But either way, not a lot. They're not getting out a lot. And they're not enjoying the sunshine. And they're not participating in good activities. And they're probably not feeling great. And so when you're around that person, you get all drained out. Hence, taking those two steps back, detaching with love, and doing what you need to do to take care of yourself. Now, I'm willing to bet that in spite of all these ideas, there's probably at least one person in this room who isn't going to be good at taking care of themselves. And I'm just going to ask if anybody has any of these things that I'm going to read. Here we go. Consistently focus on others' needs, at, even at your own expense. Being unable to receive help from others. Feeling uneasy when others focus their attention on you. A sense of self based entirely on being the helper. Much of your time and energy being spent taking care of someone else. Unable to be alone or not in an intimate relationship. Feeling responsible anytime someone close to you suffers. Seeming very competent on the outside, but actually feeling quite needy, helpless, or numb. Having experienced abuse or emotional neglect as a child, or having grown up in an addicted or mood disordered household. Rarely expressing your true thoughts, needs, or feelings because you fear that they would displease others and perhaps taking pride in this fact. Anybody? Please? I knew I was in the right group. Just knew it! No, it's you and the other guy. I mean, we're in good company. Okay, so that would be the definition of the term codependency, in case you wanted to know. Right? And, there, and, and it's a perfect hand-in-glove fit to have a person that has a mood disorder and have codependency. Because when a person has codependency, their needs are taken care of by others. When I'm the helper, I get my needs met. I get my emotional goodies by helping others. Because if I want to do it for myself, I'm not real good at it. And so therefore, I need others to make me feel good about me. And I need to be in these kind of relationships with other people that are kind of roller coastery because then I have a purpose. Because without that, I don't know what to do. So when you have people with kind of these codependent or codependent traits, let's kind of, let's kind of widen that up a little bit. So, let me kind of read a few more things to you. We're going to break them down. These are called denial patterns. Have difficulty identifying what they're feeling. Minimize, alter, deny how they truly feel. Perceive themselves as completely unselfish. Think, of, think that they can care of themselves without any pain from others, without any help from others, sorry. So it's about that. I don't know what I'm feeling, but I know how you're feeling. And I don't want to know how I'm feeling because if I know how I'm feeling, then I can't help you. So that's denial. Compliance patterns are afraid to express their beliefs, opinions, and feelings when they differ from others. Make decisions without regard to consequence. Give up their truth to gain approval. There's the key word in all of this. And to avoid change. So the key thing is I need to have your approval. I'm not going to do a whole lot without it. I need it. Control. When I talked about, you know, can't, can't cure or can't control it, can't, that 
this is all about I need to control it because if I'm running it, it's going to be okay. Because I need that. And giving up that control is the hardest thing in the world to do because somehow I think if I got it, it's going to be good. Which is actually absolute crazy because it's not good at all. It's not good to start with. But it's the perception of that. When people try to say, hey, you know, you can let that go, it's really okay, then I get angry because you're trying to take away my control. It's like, I got to do this. There's a woman who I see recently, and although her husband uses drugs, he doesn't have a mood disorder, you know, she's probably one of the best people I've seen in a long time because she figures out that as long as she's watching everything he does, he will not use drugs. At least before she came to see me. Um, and so, you know, I described her as working for the CIA. And that if she was doing her, you know, great vigilance, you know, nothing, you know, she knew what he was doing, when he was doing, how much he was doing, when he was doing, and she was on top of this. Um, side note, he still kept using drugs. Um, she was crazy. That's, right? And the same thing is true with the mood disorder. You know, you can get so over-invested in the person. Okay, they take their medications. Let's take it to 12. They take it to 4. They take it to... Okay, they didn't... Well, they don't do it. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. Didn't do it. If they don't do it, oh my God. This is really, right? And they get so hyper-vigilant about that that I lose myself in the process. Same thing. So all that control doesn't work. So the control patterns are key when we look at codependency. Okay, low self-esteem patterns. Difficulty with decisions, embarrassed to, to have recognition, praise, or gifts. Um, I have a lot of people who, who have, get compliments in my office. They play goalie most of the time. Oh, this shirt, this is really old. Oh, I've had this for like 20 years. Oh, it's nothing. Oh, you no, know, my hair, you know, I, I just combed it today. I don't know what happened. They play goalie. Every compliment, they just take it away with the goalie stick. They're really bad at it. Classic. Um, they, people don't perceive themselves as lovable or worthwhile. They're always, again, it's not, all my attention goes here. Nothing stays here. It's all there. And I'm not delusional. So really, I know this has this really difficulty make, admitting mistakes because they're perfect. They're in control. This is great. As long as I do everything right, things are great because you're going to like me and life is grand. Well, kind of. Not good at asking for what they want. Let's go back. We talked earlier about being able to communicate with I. One of the key ingredients when communicating is to be able to make a request. What, I real, what would be really great tonight is if you could you know, do what you have to do because I want to go watch American Idol. It's a request. A person that has codependency, they can't do that. They're martyrs. Well, I guess I'll clean up the sink and I'll make the lunch and I'll clean up the dishes and then I'll clean out the litter box. And I won't watch American Idol because that's just how my life is. They can't communicate their needs. Some people go as far to compromise their own values, their own sense of what's important to them, just to do things to please the other person. Which then borders on lots of really crazy and funky things. They just kind of go against their own, their own grain. Yes. Oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Sorry. I jumped the gun. I jumped the gun. I was offside. That's got to be a penalty. Um, I would like to know how you can begin a dialogue with your spouse um, about needs. Yours or his? Both of ours. Perfect. Um, in what way? Um, we shuffle around each other. Mm -hmm. We don't directly say that we need or want something. Mm -hmm. why, why do you do that, by the way? I do not know. Okay. So that's the, that's the first question. This, so that's for you. The second question is communicating that. So think request. Right? 
if you want to communicate a need that you have, you, you communicate it as a request. What would be great is if I could do this. I really could use a night out. Mm -hmm. So Friday, what I'd love to do is to go out for a couple hours. Would that be all right if that, you know, would that work well with your schedule? It's a request, okay. right? It's a request. And if you use request language, which is, you know, I would like, I would appreciate um, those kinds of things. Again, it's back to I. Mm -hmm. My personal favorite is would it be possible? Because I don't even know what tense that is, but it always works mm -hmm. out well. Would it be possible if I went out Friday? Perfect, yeah, right? Because it's a request. It's not a demand. In New Jersey, we're not good with requests. We do a lot of demands. I'm going out Friday. Okay? That's not a request. That's a demand. Staying on that, when you're dealing with a family member who has a mood disorder, I find that sometimes I do the dance because I don't want to... If he seems depressed, I don't want to bring up something that's further going to depress it. Right. Um, can you address that? Is sure. that Again, you know, you're walking on a landmine. Right. And so, forget about eggshells, it's landmines. Right, because if I raise this, he's going he's gonna to do this. If I raise this, he's going to do this. And I don't want to make him worse, so I'll say nothing. And there's never a good day to deliver bad news. That doesn't but if I'm communicating and taking care of my needs, there's always a good day. And it's going to be in the delivery of it. And if it's the I, I am sad, I'm frustrated, I'm upset, you're not going to go along with that. It's how I'm feeling. If you're going to say, you know, I'm upset because you. No, but you're upset. <laughs> See, I have my untitled book, you don't know this. It's entitled 15 Words or Less. It's been unpublished for years. And all good communication happens in 15 words or less. So if I say, I'm sad, you got 13 more. I'm sad when you do this, whatever, right? You got 15, go for it. Most people go to my favorite 12 step group, On and On, and they go on and on and on and on. And they miss, and the point got missed, you know, because most people found the mute button on their, on their spouse a long time ago. And they turned that off somewhere after, you know, the 15th time they've heard the same thing. But if I'm communicating, I, I'm sad, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, whatever that might be, about, the, about, you know, I'm really frustrated that you haven't taken a shower in two weeks. Period. The just wanted to share with you how I'm feeling. Period. <laughs> Period. I'm done. I'm done. I've communicated how I'm feeling. I'm not trying to fix it. I'm not trying to say, get, get your ass into the shower. I'm just telling you how I'm feeling. Done. Period. Move on. Next. Um, a follow-up to what I said before is I think another key is to be open to the possibility that your request might be denied Absolutely. and to accept that disappointment. Absolutely, because again, it's your feelings. Right? If we separate out how I feel from the, from the person's mood disorder, then I might say, hey, I would really like to do this. And the person would say, no, I'm going to have more feelings. That's okay, because I'm taking care of my mm -hmm. feelings. I might need to go to the gym. I might need to talk to some friends. I might need to yell and scream, not at the person, right? I'm taking care of me. I'm taking care of my feelings. Because once I work on taking care of me and my feelings, then that's okay. And the person doesn't have to like or approve, back to codependency, approve what I just want to share how I'm feeling. Again, the language is I, and it's not attacking, it's not blaming, it's not hurting, it's loving attached with love, it's loving, it's caring, it's not hurting. I have one more question. You're on a roll, you got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Then where is the boundary uh, on being selfish? I like when people have my notes in front of them. Okay. Let's do this. We have selfish, self-centered, narcissistic, and we have doormat USA. 
right? Mm -hmm. Now, the people that are self-centered, arrogant, narcissistic, the A-Rods of the world, sorry, um, right? We don't like them. We don't like them. They're gross and disgusting. We hate being around them. We need showers <laughs> after being with them, right? The doormat USA people, they're great because they'll do anything we ask them to do, but not so great for them. So to me, there is a big gap between that. And the word that I like is self-caring. If I'm taking care of myself, not to the exclusion of other people, okay. not because I'm arrogant and narcissistic, because I'm still going to take care of all the things that I usually do, I'm just going to take care of me first. Here's your metaphor. You've been on a plane once, right? And they do the speech about the plane should become depressurized, you know, oxygen mask will come down, blah, 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 blah traveling with small children, put on your own oxygen mask first, which of course no parent will ever do. Put on your own mask first. Get your own air first, then take care of everybody else. Because if you don't put on your own air first and you're traveling with small children, you won't be around to take care of those small children. You have to put on your own mask first then take care of everybody else. Something what you just said, I try to say that to my wife. You gotta take care of yourself first. Yep. You brought up that whole thing about the mask. Mm -hmm. She still feels you're still being selfish because you're <laughs> not helping out as much as... She's allowed to feel that way. So just let her feel that way and it's just... It's America, she can feel what <laughs> she wants, <laughs> right? Because her perception is you might be selfish. Okay, then you are. Okay. You're not going to change that. If you're, take, if you're taking care of self and taking care of others, you're good. If you're only taking care of self, not so good. Right. If you're never taking care of self, really bad. Right. I communicate and say, this. but sometimes I just, instead of letting her continue, I say, we had the conversation, no sense beating a dead horse. I see it your way, you see it my way, or whatever, and we just move on. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's what I've been doing. Okay. All right. This comes from the website by polarsurvivor.com, which I kind of like. It's got some good stuff on it. Um, I think this is the website that has the listing of all the, of all the famous people that are bipolar. I think. Don't quote me on that. Which is a fascinating list besides, besides the obvious people that you know have bipolar. Like, oh, I didn't know that. I think that was good. All right. False things to do if your loved one has depression, bipolar disorder, or some other mood disorder. Number one, don't regard this as a family disgrace or a subject of shame. This is a disease, biochemical, in nature, in the brain. Don't nag, preach, or lecture to the person. That's the on and on thing. Right? because that's only going to mess you up. You know, I've worked with a lot of people that, that clearly have issues with hearing, because the person has to talk to them all the time. And, and the assumption is that they can't hear, so they have to yell at a high volume, and they have to say the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, because somehow they have hearing issues. That's my assumption, because otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. Because again, after you know the 50th time, they know the speech. Try a new one. Try the I one. Guard against holier than thou or martyr-like attitude. Isn't that great? After all I'm doing for you, this is how you treat me. <laughs> Don't use the if you loved me approach. That goes nicely with the martyr. If you love me, you take your medicine today. I don't think so. I hope that you would take your medicine regardless of whether you love me or not. Absolutely. Avoid any threats and think it through. Right? Again, if the person is talking seriously about hurting themselves or others, take it seriously. Don't threaten the person. If the person say, you know, if you don't do this, I'm... Okay. Hello, police. We have a person. We need to do something about this. If the person uses drugs or alcohol, don't take it away. 
Don't try to hide it. Like my person eaten before, they will keep doing it. Guaranteed, money back, I'm not completely satisfied. If you have a person, it's a good side note, if you have a person who is using drugs and alcohol and has a mood disorder, they have two problems. They will interact with one another, and you will not know which is which, nor will they. So therefore, they have to get treatment for both. Because if the person is on medication, like antidepressants, and continues to drink, take the antidepressants, pour it in the toilet, save the pharmacy bill. I'm not suggesting that, but that's, that in the brain is essentially what happens. They need to stop drinking and drugging and take medication of the fucking hell. <laughs> when you talk about using drugs or alcohol, are you speaking about absolutely not using alcohol at all or excessive using of it? That is a great question. I'm going, let, allow me to be an idealist. If a person has a mood disorder and they're taking medication, the doctor is trying to get the symphony to be tuned up because the brain chemistry is the symphony. So you want the horns to be good, you want the, 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 violins, the, the violins to be good, you want this to sound good, you want everything to sound the way it's supposed to in the symphony. If the person puts a mood-altering chemical in there, they're messing up the symphony. That is the ideal concept. Now, you know, we can draw lines between excess and the glass of wine with dinner, but I think the safe bet is nothing, abstinence, because then you know that the symphony is perfectly tuned because of the symphony idea. Don't be jealous of the method of recovery the person chooses. Right. If the person's doing something that's working for him or her, encourage them to do it. You don't have to agree with it, but if it's working, it's working. That's the key ingredient. You know, if the person gets involved in, let's say they don't take medication, and they're taking homeopathic this, and they're doing that, and they're working out like crazy, and their mood's okay, great. You know, if it's working, it's working. If it stops working, they're going to need to do something else. It's the detached with love concept. Don't expect 100% recovery. Right. Because just like the disease, which looks like this, recovery looks like this too. There are going to be good days and bad days, better days and worse days. And back to our mood chart thing, if you can track what's going on, then you know, okay, so for the 15 snowstorms, the person got depressed. Okay, this is a no-brainer. Right? Or, G. Every time the sun came out, the person was a little bit more manic than usual. Okay. We can track that. But it's not going to be perfect because we're humans and we're going to have stresses that come our way and that's going to affect the mood all the time. Perfect. Right. Back to talking to the person. Right. I mean, okay, so I'm never going to talk to you about any of this and I'm never going to talk to you. Because there's never a good day to talk. It's about talking to the person and about figuring out, okay, this is going to be bad. Let the person be part of, empower the person, your loved one, to take care of themselves and to communicate back to you. You know, I don't want to go to this family party because there's a lot of people here that really stress me out and I don't want to see them. Give them, empower them to be able to communicate to you, this is not a good place for me to be. But do you force the issue then? Force what issue? Say they don't want to go to... You're going to tie them down to the roof rack? What? You're going to tie them down to the roof rack? But if it's a family obligation, so, so you just let them stay home, and what, what do you tell the rel you know, your relatives or anything that? Tell them to ask your person. You're not coming. See, you don't have to be this, you don't have to be the switchboard. Right? If, if this person's not coming to this family gathering, and the question gets asked, how come, then call them up. She's sitting by her phone, not answering it. <laughs> yeah. Not your job. Okay. Right? You can suggest, you can encourage. Well, you're still a parent, so it's like you can suggest and encourage. 
you can say, you know, it'd be good for you to go. It might be good to get out of the house. You may have been in the house for the last six weeks. This might be a good thing for you. Like I say, take your own car. Oh, you don't have to go. You yeah. Drive. Right. right. Come for an hour. Leave. I mean, right. You can give options, but they're not going. What are you going to court mandate them? <laughs> it's about giving them choices. So you're allowed to say what you think might be next. I'm allowed, or you're allowed. <laughs> well, you can you can suggest you know hey you know you know you, there's some people at this family gathering that you really like you might want to come it's a suggestion they're going to do whatever with that you're not going to say okay look it you know you better come because they're walking, not going to do that because you know what you're getting back in return see in physics I learned a long time ago so I never I just never actually took physics I think I got scared away but the thing that I learned by not taking it is that there's, you know, they've got those good laws and for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if you get too firm and say, you know, you know, you better do this, you know what you're getting back because you're getting just the opposite of that. Usually pertaining to a certain anatom anatomy part of your a person's hand, usually somewhere between this finger and that finger, and that's usually what you're getting. But you can suggest. If you say you better, back to our use and eyes thing, you know, I would re I would like if you came to the party on Saturday. I think the party for me is a good example. Okay. Behaviors that you know are good behaviors. What's what's a better example? Like things like you know you know the exercise is good for you. Like you know you that. Get off the couch and the doctor's advice. Everybody says that going going to the gym would be good, but the person doesn't want to go to the gym. Right. Right. Or then you know eating a lot of you know, junk food. Yes, absolutely, right, 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 right. So you can suggest, hey, you know, if, if you want, back to what Linda said before, you know, hey, if you want to go to the gym on Sunday, I'll go with you. We can, you know, we can just go for a little bit and, you know, come home. There's only two answers to that. Right. Yes, no. And you just have to accept the No, you can, right? You can, because you can probably come up with 800 good reasons why they, can, why they ought to be at the gym including bringing in all the treatment people and psychiatrists and every article that you've ever read and 62 other pages of things. You know, they said in the suddenly here, you know, I've printed out, you know, a lot of, a lot of good articles why the gym is really good for you. Save the trees. The person knows that. If they're depressed, they're not going to go. You might entice them and say, hey, you know, I'll go with you. And we'll go for a short amount of time. We'll come home. Maybe. So, at what point, when you're the adult and the person that has the illness is a child? Uh -huh. How old is the child? 24. Not a child, go ahead. Okay, well, in their mind, they're still a child. Not, not a child, um, go ahead. <clears throat> at what point do you make, well, you can't make them, at what point do you expect them to act their age or act like an adult or take responsibility for themselves. Wow. You got some pretty harsh language there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <it's> <laughs> you want to make the person, they're going to act their age, they're going to be responsible. They are responsible. They're responsible to get better. It might not be their time, though. This may not be their time. We want it to be their time. It may not be their time. But how long, like you said, how long do you wait? Do you wait a year? Now the person's 30. Now the person's 30. It may not be their time. Right? Again, you can encourage them. Get help. Take medications. Do the right things. Find a good therapist. You can encourage them to do those things. They're going to do it. They're not going to do it. It may not be their time. They may have to unfortunately feel worse to get better. So, by keeping them in your home and supporting them. Supporting or enabling? Well, supporting if they're not acting like an adult, they're not working, and they're not supporting themselves, right. then you have to support them. Right. Okay. Um,
I, see, I look at that as a, as a detriment. I'm enabling him to be... Right? So then figure out where the line is. I know back to what we said about setting boundaries. Right. Figure out what line you're going to draw. Draw one. Take it to the mat. That's the line. Whatever you can decide that you're not doing or that, that he needs to do, whatever that might be, if you'd like to live in this house, here's how this goes. Think small. Because okay, we've already gone back on our word on that. Because, right. So, you know, he had to so, so exactly either go to right? school full time or work a job. Right. And so right. It's not Draw the line you can enforce. Draw, the, draw a line that's enforceable. You're going to need to have a job by June 1st. And what happens if he doesn't? If you're ready to take it to the bank, there's consequence to that. And how do you make those consequences? How can you... You have to be ready to put in the consequence. If that means he leaves, he leaves. If that means that you know, you're not going to give him money, you're not going to give him the car, I mean... Pick, pick and choose the battles you're, you're, you're ready to do. But that's not going to make them better, just yes, because it, you pick a line. No, no, no. It's going, to, it's going to make you better. Yes, but it's not going to make the person But it's better. going to make you better. But it could make, yes. And but, if he has, okay, if you're running a hotel, he's not going to get better. Although, if you stop running a hotel, he's going to get uncomfortable. You want him to get uncomfortable, right? Think about discomfort versus pain, mm -hmm. right? If it's cold in your house, right, it's discomfort. If you have no power, it's pain. So you don't necessarily have to take it to the max on like you. Nope. You get a job or you're out. That's one line, but that's, that's not, not the healthy. only line. Right. I suspect you're doing plenty for your son. Plenty. Plenty. Figure out what you're going to stop doing as consequence for the not getting a job, for example. Think small. Don't think big. Okay. Right? Okay. Start at the bottom, not at the top. But the dilemma is mm -hmm. he's, he seems to be doing his part in getting the help. Good. Check. But encourage that. There's not... I guess it doesn't meet our expectations. Right. So then w communicate with him about what he can do. We would like you to do this. Is that doable for you? If not, what is doable? Back to those eyes. Instead of the use. Instead of the conflict on the back and forth, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Right. And think about the change process as being from the bottom rather than from the top. Because, you know, okay, if you don't do this by tomorrow, you're out of here. Okay, well, that's not going to solve anything because, A, you're not going to do it, and B, he knows you're not going to do it. So let's get rid of that. So then work from the bottom and have some dialogue with him about, okay, here's what we think would be best. What do you think? What's doable for you? Talk to his treatment people. Meet with them. We did. Good. Meet with them. Have some dialogue with them. Okay, let's set some goals about what we'd like to see happen here. Yep. Mark's going to get a workout. Hold on. <laughs> My daughter's therapist basically said she hasn't hit bottom. That may well be. Okay. I mean, to me, if you go any further, you're in China. <laughs> right? It's... It may not be her time. So you just, I mean... Encourage, love... Cheer, mm -hmm. support, figure out. Like, I mean, the, the other thing which we actually did, we actually, my wife didn't want me to do it, but I did. I called 911. Okay, honestly, once you take her to the hospital, mm -hmm. because I had text messages and other things yeah. that she threatened me. And right. Right. Both, in her mind, we were dead. Yeah, yeah. So, but the cops didn't do anything. Actually, the cops drove her to our boyfriend's house. All right. I mean, solve the problem. Even my friend who, not that type of doctor, right. says, let the power, like you said, let the powers to be, right. let Morristown make the decision. Yep. Not, you know, and they're saying, well, well, she's not threatening or doing anything harmful. Mm -hmm. So I said, but look at the text messages. Right. So they dropped the ball, 
So basically, yeah, they just right. said, right. yeah. Right. Versus calling the psych emergency, you know, next time around, call the psych emergency people, you know, how I know. Well, I actually did call them first. Right, okay. And they said to, oh, to you know, because what I tried to do was bring her, try to, con you know, she jumped out of the car, yeah. and then right. she says, you know. So, so it's, it's encouraging, I mean, the cops dropped the ball, but right? basically, okay. they're supposed to, again, they're not, they're not trained to assess. Right, that's what my friend was saying, who was a doctor, to say, not let them make right. the decision. They're trained to transport. Uh -huh. They're not trained to assess. They dropped the ball, but that, right. They should have taken her, taken her to the ER, given her a chance to get assessed, let's, let get screened, and let the professionals make the determination. That's okay. what was supposed to happen. Okay, so basically we would... You were right. Uh, okay. Oh, I thought I was wrong, but right. I thought... You were uh, right. You know, it probably uh, if you do that 100 times, probably, you know, 95 times it works out. Uh -huh. I think you found five minutes. Okay. Aren't the parents supposed to be acting like a coach if they have the ability, I mean, to guide their kids in the right direction? But if you don't, I mean, you know, do that, you don't bring their full potential. You have, they have, okay, good question, excellent, thank you. Right, the, the line here, right, between expecting them to do what they need to do and their inability to do what you want them to do. That's the line. It's hard to know that, right? Because you may think, okay, the person needs to do this, this, but they're not capable of doing that. So it's finding out what the capability is based upon their mood disorder and then working with that, right? Because a person who's depressed cognitively, they may be shot. They may not have no, they may have memory, they may not be able to organize, and to get, so getting a job might be really hard to do that. I worked with a woman once who is an executive secretary. When she was bad, oh, I saw her. She went into the grocery store and then forgot why she was there. She had a list. She didn't know where she put. I mean, she was done. I mean, here's a woman who's used to running the. I mean, right. So when people are shot, they're done. Therefore, you know, it's it's the line between your expectation, what you want for them, and their capability. Great question. All right, so where, where do we leave off? Yeah. Okay, we have another question right over here. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. It's a question going back to your uh, discussion about discomfort versus pain. Yes. When a person is depressed, they are in so much pain. Yes. So exposing them to discomfort, I don't see how that could potentially motivate them. Yes, but it does. Okay, really? think about it. Okay. If you continue to do for your person, mm -hmm. they do nothing. Okay. Right? They do nothing. If you encourage them to do things, they might do something. If you, in their case, right, if you set up some limits and boundaries, say, we're, you know, we're not going to do this anymore. They're going to need to do something because that's, cause, cause that's where the line is being drawn. Right? We're and by discomfort, we're talking about discomfort. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about discomfort. Right? Because no person, not in this room, not in any room, is going to do anything to get better until they feel discomfort, let alone pain. None of you came here tonight because you heard I was speaking and heard my great reputation and said, man, he's really good, he's funny, he does good. Nobody came because of that. You came because you're, because you're interested in the topic and you're, and you're struggling with this. That's why you came. There's discomfort and in some cases pain, right? Same so, thing. Okay. Nobody is ever going to get better to do something different without discomfort. Okay. So but, internally motivated. Yes. That's, that's the key. You want to internally motivate. The yes. person. Well, you want them to internally motivate. Yeah, them. I'm sorry. Help them to empower them empower, to yes. <laughs> right. motivate themselves. Right. Okay. Otherwise, you just get a taser and just tase them and you're <laughs> fine. You know, but I would recommend that. Okay. Thank you. I think when somebody's recuperating from a severe depression or a substantial one, the thought of getting a job could be just. It's overwhelming. Totally overwhelming. I mean, I was lucky because they had a job, you know, and they were, but often volunteering or mm -hmm. something. Right. Again, moving along the highway in small steps. Right. Right. 
Because again, if you partner with the person, then you're going to find out what they can see themselves doing as opposed to what you want them to do. Right? The person, the person has a full-time job and they're on the disabled list, they can't work, so maybe they can get back to work like one day a week, or maybe they can do two days a week, or maybe they can go half a day, or they can go mornings. They kind of break down until, okay, now I'm feeling better, I think I can do this. So small steps towards change, as opposed to the big change. All right, last of the 12 things. Do offer love, support, and understanding in the recovery, regardless of the method chosen. Right? That's the unconditional love, that's the support, because that's what it's really all about, because the person has a disease. But if the person's, and if you, if you take care of you and encourage the person to take care of them, then you can make change happen. Because when you do that, then you start with that one small step and then another small step and another small step and another small step. Now, recognize that if you're doing small steps, you also may get setbacks because that's the change process. The change process is three steps up and two steps back. The change curve never looks like this. Never, ever, 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 ever. It looks like this. Always. Always three steps up and two steps back. The question is, are they three small steps and two large steps, or three big steps and two small steps. Because remember, when the person is on the downside of the curve, that's discomfort. It might be pain too, but it's definitely discomfort. Because they know, wait a second, a couple of weeks ago I was here. How do I get back to there again? I want that back. That's discomfort. That's how change is going to happen because they say, wait a second, what, what was I doing here? If you got the right people that work with them to, hey, remember two weeks ago you were doing A, B, C, D, and E, and that was working for you? What happened? Well, I stopped doing A, I didn't do B, I'm doing half a C, not, none of D, and I forgot about E and F. So let's go back to doing A, B, C, D, and E, and let's get back to where you are. Yeah, exactly. Right? Because this comfort in the way I said, wait a minute, no, it's going to get them back to where, where they need to get to. And then from there, then they can go up three more steps and back two more steps and up three more steps. And that's how change happens. That's how people get better. But again, when you're dealing with younger folks, you know, their three steps up and two steps back is different than working with adults. Older adults. Older folks. Um, right? It's different. Because their time frame towards change is going to be different because of the nature of change. Their internal motivation source may not be as great as you want them to be, as you want it to be. So, so it's a long battle to get to where you need to be. Sometimes with adults, for example, people that have lost their job or been on the disabled list, you know, they are motivated to get back to work. So they, okay, I used to be here. How do I get there? I want to get back to there and get back to work. So they're pretty motivated to do that because there's a lot of that. There's a lot of internal stuff. So Any other questions I can answer? Um, I, my daughter that's having a problem, she's 25. Mm -hmm. My other daughter is 21. She's graduating, thank God, this year, you know, three more months. And I guess what my wife is trying to say to my youngest one is to protect herself is stay away from your sister type of thing. Unless like she's going to catch it? No, not that she can't catch it, but because she doesn't want... So, she wants her to continue with her path, and Melissa, of course, is jealous of her sister. Yeah, yeah, so she's trying to ruin her life. Sure. You know, it's like, oh, let's go out. Let's do this, especially when, you know, you're yeah. manic, you know, yeah. you don't need sleep. Sure. You know, Justine has, you know, mm -hmm. has a routine, has to go to school, has to do her clinicals yeah. and everything else. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's, like I said to my youngest, even though my oldest think it's being selfish, that I said, hey, you know, you didn't get your life, you Got out of college, you know, three times. You know, it's not like we did it. Mm -hmm. You decided to. Right. So what I'm just trying to do is just keep my youngest one away from, because she always felt that she was always the big sister anyhow. All the things but, that we've talked about here tonight for you guys, yeah. pass on to her. Mm -hmm. Because in a sibling relationship, it's a little different. But if, she's on, if she knows what the deal is, then she can also work on taking care of herself and setting limits and setting boundaries. Look, you know, you're my sister. I love you, but I'm not going out with you tonight because I, I, I got better. I got some other things to do. But I could go out with you in two nights, and when I don't have anything to do. So, yeah. so I mean, her, sometimes she still does go out with her, and I say, you know, well, then you can't get up in the morning. Right. So yeah, it affects your life. So encourage her to learn the stuff that we've learned here tonight. Okay. And get her on the right page. That's the other. That's the other thing. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Any other questions I can answer? Hold on. What if um, you... I'll start the mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what if you know a big event is coming that is going to cause them stress, mm -hmm. but you, you want to help them through it? Do they know this? Oh, yeah. Good. Encourage them to talk to their treatment people about it. Do you, should we talk about it as? Encourage them to talk to their treatment people about it. Because then you can talk to about, because then you're helping her to take care of herself, him, him, sorry. To take care of himself. And then you can have the dialogue afterwards. Because if he does, if he does the leg work, you know, I spoke to Dr. X and he said, you know, I should probably do this, 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 and this. Good. Right, so you empower him to do, to do the work. Make sense? Any other questions I can answer? Good. Well, thank you for coming on this beautiful night, bright sunshine and warm skies. And we've had a nice conversation. We've got good stuff. Thank you for your participation. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.